Hi friends, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Here's what we're discussing today. We enjoy a great many freedoms in this country. We have the freedom to live where we want, work where we want, do what we want for the most part, as long as we don't hurt somebody else. We also have the right to vote. We can choose our own elected leaders. Along with those rights come some responsibilities. And one of those responsibilities is to be a juror if we are called to be a juror. Now, not everybody can be a juror because if you have a felony background or a felony conviction, you can't be a juror. And there are some other people who are exempt. People over the age of 70, for example, are exempt. Uh, for the most part, <laughs> lawyers don't get to be on juries, not because there's a prohibition against it, but because no lawyer trying a capital case or any kind of case for that matter wants a, a lawyer on the jury. Uh, because they're afraid that they will use their legal knowledge to convince the jury to do something that maybe they shouldn't. So I, I can see that as a you know, general reason not to have lawyers on the jury. But for the most part, everybody else over the age of 18 without a felony record not only is entitled to serve on a jury, but if they are selected, they must serve on a jury. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get to participate in the decision of the jury. Because many times what happens is if a case is going to go for an appreciable amount of time, then what happens is the court picks alternate jurors to go along with the 12 who will ultimately decide the case. So in a death penalty case, for example, like the YNW Melly case, uh, you would have probably 14 to 16, probably closer to 16 because the trial was set to go for quite a while. And of those 16 jurors, 12 of them would ultimately decide the case. Before we go too far, here is a little bit of background on the Florida law. On January 12, 2016, the Supreme Court issued an opinion in Hearst v. Florida in which the court struck down as unconstitutional the capital sentencing statute. And at the time, the Florida law required a jury to make a sentencing recommendation on which only a bare majority of jurors had to agree. In other words, you could have seven to five in a 12-person jury who decided that, that the person should be sentenced to death, and as long as there were sufficient aggravating circumstances, the court would impose the death sentence. Well, <clears throat> under the statute, the jury under only rendered an advisory sentence, and it was really up to the judge. And the Supreme Court of the United States said, no, nope, Sixth Amendment requires a jury, not a judge, to find each fact necessary to impose a sentence of death. A jury's mere recommendation is not enough. Well, since then, it's amended its capital statute three times to comply with readings of the Supreme Court's law in Hearst, and second, to comply with several Florida Supreme Court cases applying that decision. So as it sits today, it is amended to, to be this statute. So this is what the statute says. Upon conviction or adjudication of guilt of a defendant of a capital felony, the court shall conduct a separate sentencing hearing proceeding to determine whether the defendant should be sentenced to death or life in prison as authorized by another statute. The proceedings should be conducted by the trial judge before the trial jury as soon as practicable. If, though, through impossibility or inability, the trial jury is unable to reconvene for a hearing on the issue, having determined the guilt of the accused, the trial judge may summon a special juror or jurors as provided in Chapter 913. So then basically it says you have to essentially determine all of the factors necessary and they have to be unanimous. And that's the current status of the death penalty in Florida. But this is not the statute that will prevail in the case from 2015. It will be an amalgam of the statute that was then in place, as well as the changes wrought by that Hearst versus Florida case. So when you go into a trial, uh, particularly a trial where there's a possibility of a death sentence, you have to understand that in addition to determining guilt or innocence 
or guilt and not guilt, since no juror really ever decides somebody's innocent. What they decide is the state didn't prove its case. In addition to that, you also have to wrestle with the moral issue of whether you could sit in judgment of someone and impose the death penalty. Now, that's not a small thing. It is, I think, a... I think it calls for a great deal of introspection and some degree of moral clarity on the sanctity of life, both the sanctity of a victim's life as well as the sanctity of a killer's life. And that is what brings me to discuss this case today. This is from the circuit court in Orlando, Florida. And let's take a listen to briefly to what happened here. Dismissing you as a juror in this case, I'm going to find that you're an indirect criminal contempt, instruct the state of Florida to file charges against you. Solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth to help you God. No juror has the right to violate the rules that we all live by. She was upset. She said that she needed to be at work that night. We were called back in the room, and the judge told us we were going to be sequestered for the night, explained the rules, and then we went back into the deliberation room, and she asked to speak to the judge, and she, about she, before she walked out, she said she was about to make that a mistrial. No intention of causing any harm, and there was no Ill, for, Ill will from my end. I was truly overwhelmed and did not know how to handle this situation. Now, to understand why this is so bad, in 2015, he was sentenced to death for murder. In 2016, Hearst versus Florida came out, and it said you have to have unanimous findings. In 2017, the conviction was vacated by the Florida Supreme Court, and then in 2020, it thought better of that process and said that in some instances, those could be reinstated. So they tried to reinstate it, and then the Florida Supreme Court again said, no, nah, we made that vacator final, so now you have to have a sentencing hearing. Then in 2023, this jury was impaneled, and the juror caused the mistrial. And now, 12 years later, January of 2024, a new jury is going to be impaneled to hear the death penalty case. So, in this case, not only did the juror after the jury had heard all of the evidence, come and say, well, I talked to a friend about this, so I violated the court's rule, thereby requiring the court to essentially cause a mistrial. But later on, she said, well, you know, I didn't really talk to anybody. I just didn't want to participate in this jury trial. So we'll get to what happened to that in just a moment. But I want to point out a couple of things. One of the things that happens, if you've never been a juror before, one of the things that happens is you go in and you have this long exercise where you ask a whole bunch of questions, some of them very personal, and at some point in time they narrow it down to a selection of people who could potentially be on the jury. So you might start with 120 people in a capital case, 120 people in a room, and they're all being asked questions, and then at some point you're down to perhaps 30 or 40 people from which, from which this jury will be selected. Now, it's important to recognize that one of the things that happens initially is that you are required to take an oath. Now, the oath in most cases is pretty general. I, as a juror, solemnly swear that I will follow the court's instructions, I will follow the jury instructions, and I will try this case fairly. In other words, you won't bring any pre-existing biases in, all of that sort of thing. You'll, you'll listen to the instructions of the court, and you'll render a true verdict at the end of it. Well, Florida has an interesting process in terms of death penalty cases. If you look at the law in many states, what you have is one trial. And at the end of the trial, the jury votes both for guilt or innocent, guilt or not guilt. And then they also vote for whether or not there should be the imposition of the death penalty. The 
the, the death penalty is usually separate. It's a second part because you have to consider a bunch of mitigating evidence. Now, you'll see a lot of people really complain about having to sit through mitigating evidence so that you might have to feel sorry for somebody who killed someone else. But it's important to understand that not everybody gets up in the morning wanting to kill someone. Sometimes in the course of pursuing a criminal career, something happens and they wind up killing someone. And in many cases, they truly regret it, not just because they got caught, but because really they didn't really want to kill someone. Many times they will actually argue that it was an accident. And the re one of the reasons they do that, of course, is so they can get a voluntary manslaughter, which is usually around 10 to 12 years in the slammer, as opposed to either the Kevorkian cocktail and a flat line or life in prison. And you know, I'm not really sure whether or not I would, I might just prefer, I think, to be put down like a rabid dog as opposed to having to sit for 30 or 40 years in a, in a state prison. Uh, that's just me personally. I'm sure other people have different views on that. But the long and short of it is that there is this process that must be respected. In that particular case, the juror violated their oath. So they took an oath, and then they essentially admitted that they'd perjured themselves when they told the judge that they had talked to someone else. And as a result of that, the young lady was sentenced to 179 days in jail. So here is someone who came to court based on a essentially an, an order of the court to come and present themselves for jury duty who made it all the way through the jury selection process, got into the jury room and decided, I'm out of here. And as a result, she's going to do 179 days in jail. Now, in this particular case, it has a long history. I think they said it was about eight years. And what happened was, initially, the, the criminal was sentenced, or the felon was sentenced to a death penalty for murdering a 17-year-old boy who was going to testify against him. And again, here is the timeline involved from 2015 through 2024. So the jury found aggravating circumstances, and as a result of that, they sentenced him to death. And, of course, there are certain things that a jury has to find. Here is a copy of the state statute in that regard. And here are some of those aggravating circumstances. It was convict committed by a person previously convicted of a felony, uh, previously convicted of another capital felony, kidnapping, uh, created a great risk of death to many persons, the felony was committed for pecuniary gain, the felony was committed to disrupt or hinder lawful exercise of governmental function, especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel, uh, all of these things. The victim was a, of the capital felony was under 12. The victim was vulnerable due to advanced age. It was a criminal gang member, was committed by a criminal gang member, and uh, the, committed by a person designated as a sexual predator. And then these are the mitigating circumstances. The defendant has no prior history and this sort of thing. Uh, those are much easier to find in many of these cases simply because the defendant then gets a chance to get up there and tell about how he was, you know, beaten, abused as a child. His brain doesn't work right. He never graduated from high school and all of that kind of thing. So the jury has to find all of those circumstances, all of those aggravating circumstances, or not all of them, but at least one of them, in order to impose the death penalty. And then it has to make a separate determination as to whether or not the death penalty is appropriate, and a lot of people can't do that. Normally, those people are excluded from the jury pool initially by virtue of, of when they're asked that question, could you, you know, if, the, if we prove this and the, and the case is as we say it is, 
and this is really a heinous thing that happened, could you follow the court's instruction and impose a death penalty? And a lot of people, and I'm sorry, myself included, would say, I have a moral reservation against sitting in judgment of someone. Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. And he meant it in a different context. He meant it, don't judge hypocritically. But be that as it may, I don't believe I am capable of determining what's in someone's heart. And as a result, I do not believe that I could bear the moral stain of sentencing someone to death. Now, you're free to disagree with me on that, and I know many of you will, and I'm okay with that. One of the re- I think sometimes the death penalty is an important thing to have. I just could not do it. And as a result, I'd be excluded from that jury. I would not have the opportunity. Death qualified jury panel is consist it basically consists of everyone on that panel being ready, willing, and able, if the, the court proves up the facts, to sentence somebody to death. That brings to mind the question of why this young lady was on the jury in the first place. Did she have some sympathy for the defendant? Did she perhaps have some connection to the defendant? Did she believe that people like the defendant were being treated unfairly? I don't know the answer to that. What I do know is that she bollocked up the system not only for the defendant who had a right to have a jury determine this, but also for the family of the victim. They've been waiting, I believe they said, eight years to try to get justice for what happened to their son. And the the father of the young man has been in court every time there's been a proceeding to monitor the proceeding. And that's the way our system is designed to work. One of the trade-offs of a, a democratic system, a republic system, is that we give up the right to go execute vengeance on our own behalf, and we allow the state to execute that vengeance for us. Now, whether that's putting somebody into a tiny cage for the rest of their life, or, as I said before, whether it's, you know, slipping them the, the uh, medication that Dr. Kevorkian liked to give, doesn't really matter because one way or another they're either alive or they're dead and if you can't deal with people being dead then you shouldn't be on the jury that decides a death penalty case and i'm not sure which of those happened but i know she was very tearful and very apologetic when she talked to the judge and said you know she didn't know the gun was loaded the she didn't un- I think the check was going to clear i don't know she made a bunch of excuses for why she did this but at the end of the day It costs the taxpayers additional money to go through this process again and again, and she absolutely should have been sentenced to jail. It is just a shame that for indirect criminal contempt in Florida, the maximum amount of time somebody can serve is 179 days, and that's what happened. So that's what I have for you today. I really appreciate you being here. If you have been a juror in a criminal case, please let me know in the comments what you thought about the process and whether you could or could not be on a death penalty jury. Could you impose the maximum penalty on someone who, you know, perhaps one of the October 7th massacre people? But at any rate, if you would, let me know what your thoughts are and what your feelings are about the death penalty. I think it's an interesting concept and an interesting debate we we could have. In the interim, if you have the opportunity, do something nice for somebody today. I happened to be driving today earlier, and uh, a gentleman opened the door for me. I I was very pleased that he did that. And I had the opportunity to tell one of the people who runs a store down in Andalusia, Alabama, how much I appreciated the fact that they took such good care of the store, and it was a great place to stop and get gasoline and pick up a bottle of of Diet Coke or Diet Dr. Pepper. So, again, doesn't take a whole lot to make somebody's day, but to the extent that you can, you really should try it. Thanks again for watching. Catch me down here at the beach again next time.
you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.